Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I think we're about ready to get started. Can you hear me okay with that? Okay. I'm Richard Piacentini. I'm the Executive Director of the Phipps Conservatory and Botanical Gardens. And we're really glad to see all of you here tonight for the Biophilia Network. How many of this, you, this is your first time here? Oh, well, great. Welcome. Glad to have you here. So just so, just so everybody knows, well, we, we like to start these meetings at 5.30. The idea is a chance for people to get to meet and greet and mingle. And then around 6 o'clock, we'll get started, and we'd like to start off by getting everybody present. And usually we're not going to have Susan Spangler. that will lead us in a brief little uh, meditation to get us all started, get settled and present. And then we'll have a presentation for about a half an hour or so, and have another 20 minutes or so for questions and discussion and that usually brings us up to around seven o'clock and then we have another half hour to mingle and continue to, to continue the discussion in small groups or as individuals wherever you feel best and then uh, and then we hopefully we'll see you back here again next month okay you know we have a meetup website we have all the past presentations on the website we also have the upcoming presentations, and if anybody has any ideas of new people that we should get to bring, to bring here to help us uh, figure out new ways to connect with nature, you know, please let us know, and uh, we'll be happy to consider them to them on the list. So before, we get, before I introduce Adam, uh, I'd like to ask Susan to come up and help us all get the rest. Again, welcome everybody. Um, so as the last few people are trickling in, you might want to take a position that's just very comfortable <laughs> for you, with both feet on the ground. You might want to have your hands on your thighs or on your lap. And as Richard said, we're just going to take a couple minutes just to really let ourselves fully arrive here. We've all come from busy days. So to begin with, if it's comfortable for you to let your eyes gently close, let your eyes close. If you'd like to leave them open, just let the gaze be downward and soft. And begin simply with bringing your awareness to sensation. Perhaps first to the sounds in the room. To the feeling of your feet touching the ground, sensations in the soles of the feet. the palms of the hands. Just letting yourself fully arrive in the moment by bringing awareness to whatever you're arriving with, the feelings and sensations of the body, however they are, pleasant or unpleasant, without judgment. And finally, feeling a place, finding a place where you can feel the body breathing. And simply letting awareness or your mind rest on the feeling of the body breathing. Feeling the air feel, or the air fill the body, oxygen and feeling the breath release and let go into space, and letting go with the out-breath. <coughs> and 
taking a few more breaths with awareness of breathing in and breathing out. And when you hear the sound of the bell, the invitation is simply to follow the sound of the bell into silence. And then when you're ready to lift your gaze while you continue to enjoy the feeling of the body breathing. increases and the negative impacts, effects on the land become increasingly apparent, more and more people are seeking ways to create positive change. In order to protect the land, Adam suggests humans must first connect to the land. This presentation will introduce the concept of foraging for food and medicine as one of the easiest and most effective ways to solidify this lasting connection. Adam will also discuss the work he is doing with EarnYourLand.com an online database and community of Pennsylvania's naturalists, nature organizations, state parks, and environmental centers. Please join me in welcoming you, Adam. for medicine. What a radical concept in the 21st century, right? Yet, perhaps this is exactly what our planet needs more of right now. More foragers, more active participants, not spectators, not analysts, not theorists, but active participants in this beautiful dance between Mother Earth and creature. Creature and Mother Earth. I've been coming to these meetings for a while now. I came to the very first meeting in October of 2013. We sat at a long table and we discussed the implications of biophilia, what it means to us. And I've been coming to a lot of meetings ever since. I usually sit right back in the corner. <coughs> and you know, we talk a lot about how do we get people more involved with nature? How do we get people outside? How do we get people to care about the messes that some human beings are creating for all the other human beings out there? And yet, it's interesting to me that very rarely, if ever, do we ever discuss something so obvious. Something that humans have literally done the majority of our time on this planet. That's foraging for food, foraging for medicine. This is a topic that I'm deeply passionate about. I'll never forget what it first did for me when I first got into it. So many years ago, when I first was introduced to this concept, what it did for me originally was it helped to tease apart this wall of green. I think a lot of us know about this wall of green. It's easy to look outside and just get lost in it and just see trees, just see bushes, just see shrubs, just see plants, 
Jesse grass, and my favorite, the Jesse weeds. But within this wall of green is a vast and diverse ecosystem of countless species, many plants, many mushrooms, many of them edible, many of them medicinal. When I found this out and was able to tease apart this wall of green, I went all in <clears throat> to where it's a passion of mine now. It's not a hobby. It's not an activity. It's not something I just dabble in. It's a passion. It is a lifestyle for me. It is something that is quite literally, and I don't mean this as a joke, I don't mean it to be taken lightly, but it has quite literally saved my life. And I mean that it, is, it has provided more guidance, more mentorship, more answers to questions that I didn't even know that I had. And I'm here to tell you, listen, if you were confused in any way, and let's face it, it's the 21st century, yes, it's a good time to live in, but it is a strange time to live in. There's a lot of weird things going on right now. I think if we were honest with ourselves, we would put some words to it. We'd actually speak out about it. And a lot of us are confused, and you can see it out there. You look outside, and you see that confused look on people's faces. You ride the trolley, you ride the Port Authority bus, and you see the confused look on people's faces. You stand at the corner of Forbes and Murray, you go to a shopping mall, and if people aren't glued to their phones, a lot of them are confused. They put that down, you strip it away from them, just say, no, 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 just sit still for a second. Then that confusion arises. If you ever feel that way, if you don't know what all this is for, if you're kind of lost, you just want some answers, pay attention tonight. Because the information that I'm about to share with you, if you follow it out, if you just don't write it down, I hope some of you write some things down. If you just don't write it down, if you just don't feel something, but if you live it, actually live it, it'll make all the difference. If you'll be rewarded with more gifts than you knew you deserved. So many years ago, I remember vividly being asked this question, that million dollar question, what do you want to do? <laughs> it's a good question whether you're 18 or 80, because nothing is static, it's always going to change. That's the way, the way the universe works, it's always moving, it's dynamic. What do you want to do? And I remember, I remember the exact spot where people would ask me that question, where I was, what I was doing. I can, I can tell you the names of those people if you want, but to a lot of them it's irrelevant. And I remember coming to this one conclusion, this one answer, it just came out of me. And it was this. I just want to get people outside. I just want to take them into nature. And usually I was in the woods with somebody at the time. I just want to take them out there. I didn't know why. I didn't know if I wanted to teach them anything. I just knew I was feeling something. And I knew that they were feeling something different. I wanted to pull them out of the stressful habitats that they created for themselves and just bring them outside. Just watch that tension drop from their shoulders, drop from their soul. Be careful what you wish for, because <laughs> dreams do come true. So now I lead a lot of foraging walks, workshops, classes, presentations throughout the year. It's what I do. People say, that's what you do? That can't be all you do. It's what I do. I leave all kinds of groups out. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter what background they come from. So in the top left, I've taken out the Wilkinsburg Community Youth Group. I take out Mount Lebanon School District. I've taken out the UPMC Body Changers, a group of great individuals dedicated to healthy weight loss, and countless others. And we talk about all kinds of things, all good things. So right now, the spring greens are coming up. A lot of the wildflowers are out. Then we move into the perennial greens and the fruits, and then the, the fall fruits, and then the nut-bearing trees in the fall, the acorn. Anybody here an acorn eater? You ever eaten acorns before? That's great. You tried. Did you say you tried? What happened? Go when you're little. Yeah. You haven't lived unless you've had acorn porridge. A little bit of maple syrup, a little bit of sea salt, sunflower, sea butter, some service berries. You know, Pennsylvania, I think its greatest food is the acorn. Not wild food, but its greatest food is the acorn. You know, it's interesting. People from out of town come here and say, Where's a good place to eat? You know, they're out of state. So we say, Permanis. <laughs> Think of something more creative than Permanis. Everybody says Permanis. I'm sure it's a great place, but everybody says Permanis. <laughs> You're on the east side of the state, they probably say, Philly cheesesteak or the Waffle House down the street at the Thai restaurant. You come to me, I say, go to that red oak tree up on top of that hill. Quercus rubra up there. That 100 year old tree, it's around 100 pounds of acorns right now. But we don't just talk about food and medicine. That's not what it's all about. When I get people out into the woods, we talk about the topography of the land. Why are certain species up here? Why are some down here? Why do beech trees have smooth bark? When all those other trees, the cherry tree, the shag bark hickory, the oak trees, 
They've got rigid furrow bark. What's going on with that? What's going on with the hemlock trees today? The hemlock woolly dungeons having a feast on our state tree right now. Is it the worst thing in the world, though? 5,000 years ago, the hemlock trees were nearly wiped out. So Harvard researchers say. They came back. They're strong. They're resilient. We talk about poison ivy. You can't eat poison ivy. Don't even try to eat poison ivy. Because some people have eaten poison ivy, but you're not going to do it. It's a teacher plant. People say, why do you like poison ivy? I love poison ivy because it teaches you to be present. When you're out in the woods, you can't just be moseying around like it's your backyard, like it's your bedroom, like it's a shopping mall. You have to be out there with intention. Yes, there's a time and place for moseying around in the woods, but if you're not careful, it's going to make its presence known. Nettles will make their presence known before you even see it. We talk about invasives. You know, everybody loves to hate on the invasives, but why not address those underlying conditions? Why aren't the native plants actually thriving? What have we done to the land? Why is it so damaged? Why is it so disturbed? What's allowing these invasives to come in? We can pull, pull, pull all we want, but we also have to, under un we also have to address what's going on with that land underneath. We talk about Japanese barberry. Some of you know Japanese barberry. Some people love it, some people hate it. You can actually eat those fruits of Japanese barberry. You can eat the leaves, but perhaps the roots contain those powerful antibiotic in nature known as berberine. And you can make medicines out of that. But honestly, what it's really about, and I don't really advertise this, I don't really put it on my flyers, what it's really about, why I really get people out there. Because I don't think they would show up. But I'm going to tell you tonight. You ready for it? Yeah. I don't think you're ready for it. <laughs> The reason I answered that way years ago, I just want to get people outside, I figured it out, what it's all about, why I really like to get people outside, what it's all about underneath all of this. It's not just about food, guys. It's not just about medicine. It's about reuniting us, you, me, every individual out there, reuniting us with a long-lost lover, a lover that has been taken away from us, a love that has been sold back to us in bits and pieces in such an adulterated form. And that is our land. You know, something strange is going on right now. Human beings are disconnecting from their land. They're disconnecting from nature at an alarming rate. We are literally cutting all ties with the natural world to where we are barely hanging on by a thread. Now, not this community here, and not a lot of people out there. I mean, we are on the front lines trying to get people out there. And I think that's great. It's admirable. But let's be honest. As a species, that's the way it seems to be going. Cutting a tie here, cutting a tie there. We've been told that we can use, we can misuse, we can abuse all the resources, all the gifts of the land, because we can just live off of plastic. <laughs> and then we just throw it away when we're done. When the landfills are filled, you know what we can do? We can go colonize another planet. And honestly, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of research being spent on that, getting us off of this planet, as if this isn't the best thing that we have going for us right now. Now, I'd be more inclined to be a devout follower of this way of life, to believe it, to preach it, if the results showed otherwise. But let's be real here. What's it really like out there? Let's be real. Let's open up all 555 of our senses right now. Let's be open to it. What is the quality of the water like today? <coughs> Terrible. <laughs> Somebody's, I didn't say it. Somebody said it. Compared to many generations ago, there's a body of water that separates Oakland from the south side, where I live. I want to swim here. I do. But I can't swim in that water. The Monongahela comes from the native word Monongahela. means banks falling in, because the sides of the Monongahela are built out of clay. When they wash into the river, the shale and the sandstone banks fall in. It's just an interesting geological feature, Monongahela. But I cannot swim in that water. Why? There are signs in the south side that say, please limit contact with these waters at this time. <laughs> now, I don't follow all the rules. I don't really like signs. I think there's way too many signs out there right now. But I, for some reason, I follow that sign. You know, a marine-based diet is a good diet. Eating animals from the sea, animals from the water. Omega-3s, anti-inflammatory. But I probably wouldn't base my marine diet off of those animals in the Nongahela. That's just me. You can do whatever you want. It flows into another body of water, as if there's such a thing as 
another body of water that the Monongahela flows into. It's just humans like to make distinctions. What it flows into something else called the Ohio River. We have a new term for the Ohio River. It's a phrase. I think it's American. It's called most polluted body of water in nation. That's what Ohio River means today. That's a report from last year. 23 million pounds of chemicals were dumped in the water last year. And that's for the seventh year in a row, most polluted body of water. I can't even fathom a 10 pounds of chemicals. What does that even look like? 23 million with a capital M underscore 444 times. Why is that happening? Why is that happening? There are some humans, some, who don't see that connection between healthy water, healthy ecosystem. Healthy ecosystem, healthy people, happy people, cancer-free people, long-lived people, they don't see it. So the Ohio River is a chemical dumping ground right now. What's the quality of our air like today? Damn, who's saying that? Is that you? <laughs> okay, 100 years ago, that was pretty terrible. Now it's a little better. But according to stateofair.org, we did an F for ozone. We did an F for 24-hour particle pollution. We fail annual particle pollution levels. It's not good today. It's one of the worst in the nation. It really is. We've done a lot of work. We've improved a lot. But there's still a long way to go. I open up my window, I can smell sulfur dioxide in my house. I don't think I'm supposed to be sniffing sulfur dioxide. What is the quality of our land like today? If I said, hey, I want to go on a hike after this, point me to the old growth forest in Shenley Park. <laughs> you just point me to this massive oak, these massive hemlock trees, where are they? Why do I have to drive 120 miles one way just to get to the nearest old growth forest? Where's it at today? Now, it's not just like all of this affects the animals. It just affects the pollen. Just the modern butterflies are harmed by this. It affects us. Why? This is a good one for your notes. Write this one down. The land is a nutrient. Nature is a nutrient. It's the one nutrient that no nutritionist will ever, ever talk about. And yet, conventional organizations like the Mayo Clinic on the left, the University of Maryland Medical Center on the right, they have healthy habits for people. Where's nature? I mean, take care of your teeth. That's, that's good. <laughs> Follow good safety practices. Very specific. Try something new. That's great. These are all great things. We should all be doing this. But where's nature? I mean, what happens, for example, if you don't get vitamin C in your diet? What happens? Yeah, you terrible, right? <laughs> you die, yeah. Scurvy, it's very sick. Eat what kind is, you won't get scurvy. What happens if you don't get vitamin C, if you can't make it? Rickets, pretty serious. D. D, as in dog. C was first, then I moved to D. Did I say C the second time? D, rickets. We added that out. If you don't get vitamin D, you'll see this cool fade right in that part on the video. <laughs> if you don't get vitamin D, that's not going to be answered. Because <laughs> now you're laughing. That's good. You pay attention. If you don't get vitamin D, you get rickets. What happens if you don't get nature? What happens if we don't get this often enough? What happens? Boredom? You won't be bored out here, trust me. There are too many challenges for you to be bored out here. Confusion, back to that confused gaze. Claustrophobic. Claustrophobic, yeah, that's a good one right there. Depressive symptoms set in, lack of connection. You see, the health of the land is directly tied to the health of the people. The health of the people is directly tied to the health of the land. Let's put some statistics behind what happens when we don't get this nutrient on a daily basis. You cut a tie with the natural world, one in three women get cancer today. Do you think that 23 million pounds of chemicals in the Ohio River has anything to do with that? At all? Like, just a little bit? I don't know. I don't do that kind of research. Cut another tie. One in two men today get cancer. Do you think that the air pollution has anything at all, even just a smidge, has anything to do with that at all? I don't know. I don't do that kind of research. 
Cut another tie. One in nine over 65 have Alzheimer's. Cut another tie. One in three over 85 have Alzheimer's. And we're told this is normal. You try to talk to people about this. One in three women get cancer in a lifetime. Yeah, I know. I saw the report on online somewhere. I saw it. I read it in the paper. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to tell me. You know what? Literally, like 23 million pounds of chemicals are dumped in the Ohio River every year. Yeah, so what? Ken Jesse's coming this year, right? Guns and Roses this year, baby. <laughs> It's like trying to tell a fish to swim in water. It's like, what's water? It's just that's the way it is. But it's not normal. You know why? Because there are cultures around the world today, healthy cultures, long-lived cultures, who don't know what diabetes is. They don't know what heart disease is. They don't know what cancer is. And it's not because they're dumb. It's not because they're stupid. It's not because they're primitive. It's not because they're cave women. Cave women. It's not because they don't have PhDs in epidemiology. It's not because they don't have their MD credentials. It's because they don't have these things. But you know what they do have? They have ties to their land. They have connections to the natural world. They cherish them. They will fight to protect them. That's how much it means to them. And so they live good lives. We could have that today in the 21st century. Here in Pennsylvania, here in Pittsburgh, PA, we can have that. But we need to reconnect ourselves. On a, on a deep, intimate level, we need that reconnection. So how are we going to do it? What's one of the best ways to do it? Look, we can, what did you say? Go, I said go outside. Go outside, exactly, go outside. We can't just sit in an office all day and crunch numbers. It's fine, it's not enough. You would never do that. Somebody said I wouldn't ever do that. Some people do that. We can't just petition and fire all day. It's not enough. Today, it is not enough. We can't just tweet about it all day. What's one of the best ways, one of the most effective ways to reconnect ourselves to our land? Something that's so obvious, something that we have been doing for literally the majority of our time on this planet. You ready for this? I don't think you're ready. You ready for this? We can eat that land. We can drink that water, spring water. You can drink it. One more time. We can eat from that land, and we can drink that water. Mind-blowing, I know. Think about it. You are what you eat. What you put in your body, it becomes who you are. Food is not inert. It becomes who you are. You can literally become those lands you want to protect. It will become you. You will protect it. You won't let people walk all over it if that's you. Listen, you are what you eat. I studied nutrition at Pitt. I learned this in first grade. You are what you eat. You can be whatever you want. Food just doesn't pass through you. You assimilate it. You can't build yourself out of nothing. Build yourself out of those lands that you want to protect. Do you want to be a ho-ho? <laughs> do, do you want to be a dum-dum? Do you want to be an ice cream sandwich? Do you want to be a cheeseburger? Or do you want to become a wild creature? Why isn't anybody laughing? Because I'm awakening something inside of you. I know I am. You can become a wild creature. You can become fit. You can become strong. You can become robust. You can become resilient. Like a dandelion. How strong is a dandelion? You need poison to kill a dandelion. Poison's not going to stop us. It'll take years before it stops us. You can become like a dandelion. Think how fit, think how strong, think how robust that thing is. You pull it out, it's coming back. Food for thought. Many of us garden in here, right? Any gardeners? Great. One of the greatest things you can do is garden. Honestly, really, I have a little garden. Those who know it just laugh at me right now if they knew what my garden looks like. I mean, if you know what my garden looks like, you'd probably laugh. But I, I love it. I really do. I cherish that little plot of land. Think about it. You are connected to your land, if you garden, through your food, right? Those of us who garden here, whether we own that land, whether we rent that land, whether we just have a pot with some plants in there, we love that land. We cherish it. We're not going to trash it. We're not going to litter it. We're going to think about it in January when there's two feet of snow on the ground. We're going to dream about it. We can't wait to get our hands in that soil. We love that land. You are directly connected to your immediate land because of your food. What about the wildlands? How are we going to connect to them? Because they need protection too. 
Just like we connect to our land through our food choice, we can do the same thing with lands 15 miles away, 30 miles away, 100 miles away, by going out there and building ourselves out of that land as well. If you want to protect it, become it. Same way you connect to your land through your food choice, we can do the same thing with lands that are being destroyed right now by going out there and eating it. And it moves us beyond an analytical connection. Think about it. A lot of people have an analytical connection with nature. We know a whole lot. That's just the way the educational system has trained us. Know things. Repeat it back. Spit it back to me. Come on. Quickly. Just like everybody else. Memorize it. And then move on. Maybe we'll forget it. Who cares? Because it's just up in your head. Now, knowing things, that's a great start for sure. I like knowing things about nature. And so many of us here, if we would go to Shenley Park right now, could name 15, 20 species of wildflower. I think that's a great goal. If you can't do that right now, maybe make it a goal for this year or next year. And then move on to 30, 50, 100 wildflowers. Many of us can go down to Duck Hall at Frick Park and name 15 species of waterfowl. And you're going to claim you saw it first. I know it. I know how burgers are. You guys are like that. <laughs> we can go up to Cook Forest. And many of us can name the big trees up there. The huge eastern white pine, the massive hemlock trees, that massive cherry tree on the Longfellow Trail. It's remarkable. I just saw it there a couple weeks ago. The yellow birch. The black birch, the tulip poplar, the cucumber magnolia. We know a whole lot. That's not enough. It's a good start. It's not enough. We need an emotional connection as well. We need to be emotionally bonded to our land. It's probably more important than the analytical connection, honestly, today. E.O. Wilson, the guy, the biologist, the reason we're here. Does anyone know who E.O. Wilson is? Biophilia. He's the guy who created that term, biophilia. He defined it as an emotional affiliation between human beings and living organisms. Emotional, not analytical, not up here, right down in here, your heart. The emotional affiliation. Look, just like you know the name of your spouse, you know the names of your children. You know the names of those closest to you. You know the names of your neighbors. But that Bob that you love, Bob. <laughs> It's different than that Bob you saw at a Motley Crue concert six years ago. That spilled beer on you. You know who he is. You see him around. But he's not your Bob. He's different. He's probably a valuable member of the community, a valuable member of the church, a great employee. But he's not the same. Why? What makes everybody different? The people that are close to you. You love those people close to you. Admit it. You love them. Tell them today that you love them. Not in a clingy kind of way, but you love them. You give them some space. When in doubt, lean out. Put that on your fridge. Once you love them, you cherish them, you would protect them from harm, wouldn't you? You have their best interests in your mind, and the best part is they reciprocate. You know they care about you. If you were straight on the side of the road, you'd give them a call and be there in a second. That's an emotional connection. You just don't know their name. You're emotionally tied to them. What about the land? Is it enough to know it? Do you think the developers care that you just know the species on that land? It's not enough. Emotional affiliation. We need it today more so than ever before. Think of it this way. There's a plot of land. It's public. A lot of native plants on there, but there could be more. <clears throat> It's a patch of common bone set on this land. Eupatoria profolia, member of the Aster family. Beautiful plant that flowers in August, September, October. It's perfoliate, so the leaves, I know it's blurry right here, but they poke right into the stem. Very unique for a plant. The leaves are kind of wrinkled, but it's a beautiful plant. Sarah, her immune system's not doing too well. She speaks to her healthcare practitioner, a cool one, who says, oh, that plot of land that you guys you know, hang out in, isn't there a patch of common bones set there? This is a cool healthcare practitioner. <laughs> and she says, yeah. Check out this study. Taking bone set internally stimulates the process of phagocytosis. That's where your immune system cells engulf pathogenic bacteria presented to a lysosome that pff, shoots out of your body. It doesn't work exactly like that, but I'm kind of speaking metaphors. But it boosts your immune system. Sarah starts taking it, and it's working for her. And she's giving it to her friends. And it's working for them, too. And other members of the community are using it as well. So they don't have to go to Rite Aid to get their medicine. And it's working for them. Now the bone set is thriving in that patch. 
They were harvesting too much. If they did, they wouldn't have their medicine. More species are moving in. Joe Pileweed's coming back. Old Joe, he's, he's back in that field. Ironweed back. More asters are coming back. Because they are tending to that plot of land. They're going to make sure that it's there because they need it. Lots of new wildlife moving in as well because they like that as a nesting habitat, even that thick patch of bone set. Over there on the hillside, John, his blood sugar levels aren't, aren't so hot these days. He speaks to a cool healthcare practitioner. You gotta hang out with these cool healthcare practitioners. They're out there, trust me. I'm not one of them. <laughs> Who says, John, listen to me. You can take medications or check out this study. There was a double blind placebo-controlled randomized trial showing that those who took stinging nettle leaf extract, their blood sugar levels went down, their fasting blood glucose levels went down, their postprandial, two hours after eating a meal, blood glucose levels went down, their hemoglobin A1C. Sounds like a rap group, I swear, it's actually a marker for your blood glucose. Their, heme, their hemoglobin, glycated hemoglobin levels went down. So he said, okay, I'm sold, I'm gonna take it, and you know what? It's working for him. His blood sugar levels have never looked better in his life. And his wife's taking it too. Not only that, they're eating. I didn't realize I didn't put this on here. They're eating it as well. And this is a native variety, by the way. Urtica dioca subspecies grassless is a native stinging nettle. They're eating it as well because he did some research and he found that it's more nutritious than anything that he could even grow. It's healthier than his kale. It's healthier, it's more robust than his Swiss chard. High in iron, high in calcium, high in pro-vitamin A, high in vitamin C, high in protein. He doesn't have to support a farm in California, even if it's organic, even if it's non-GMO. He doesn't have to use borrowed water from a different state just to grow the crops out there. He doesn't have to have it shipped 2,500 miles east to his home because he's using those stinging nettles and the community is as well. And the Red Admiral Butterfly is back. Hasn't been seen in five years, but that's its host plant. And it's back. The alders are loving it as well. The red maples are loving it because everybody's tending to this land. They're not harvesting too much because if they did, it wouldn't be there. And now it gets good. <laughs> because the land is for sale. The developers move in. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> they want to put a movie theater on this plot of land. The movie theater is going to be put right on. Yeah, let's put it right on the bone set. There goes the bone set. There goes Joe Pie Weed. There goes the Iron Weed. There goes all those little animals. They want to put a parking garage in too, right on the patch of stinging nettles. And top it off. An energy company wants to come in, and they send a pipeline right through the red maple patch. And so there goes that small family business. There are people making sugar for the community. There it goes, out the window. Now, this is a very likely story, because it is happening. It's happening every day. How likely would John and Sarah and the rest of the community be to allow these developers to do that? How likely, honestly? Do you think they would let them do that? Wouldn't they at least put up a fight? Those plants just aren't for the pollinators. It's just not for the wildlife. It's just not looking beautiful. It's just not rehabilitating the land. People are actually using it as well. They have an emotional affiliation with the land as well. Not only that, they need these species. Because they need them, they are there. Listen, if you want something in life, if you want native plants to thrive, need them. If we need them, they will be there. Whatever you need in life, whatever it is, the universe will provide it for you if you really need it. It's a universal law, write that down. If you need it, it will be there. I don't know how it happens, it just happens. It might not happen overnight, it might take six years, it'll be there. If you need native plants, they will be there. Say one more time. If we need, as a culture, native plants, they will be there. But what do we need as a culture today? We need corn, wheat, and soy. We need millions of acres of corn, wheat, and soy to feed grain-fed cattle because people need to eat that. We need artificial fertilizer because the land, the conventional land, is just taxed right now. That's what we need as a culture. We need roads to get from point A to point B. I'm not saying it's bad, it's just what we need. We need a president of the United States to rule over us. That's the system we have built for ourselves. And so we need it. 
We were going to vote one in office. You know, just a couple centuries ago, we didn't need a president. Didn't need one. We need one now, so we're going to put one in office. Whether he or she is confident or not, we're going to vote one in office. Whatever we need will be there. Look, this shifts the perspective of a forager just being a taker of the land. Someone who just picks spittleheads and real mushrooms. To people who actually steward the land. People who actually improve the land. Make it better for their generation and future generations as well. Because they are doing it in a sustainable way. So honestly, Adam, how sustainable is this? Because that is not what's sustainable right there. Is it sustainable to be a forager today? Everything that I mentioned about foraging, for food, for medicine, for whatever, I mean with incredible intention, in the most sustainable way possible, always with that species longevity in mind. Maybe I'm the minority, but that's how I feel. There are 12 million people in Pennsylvania right now, 300,000 in Pittsburgh alone. You're probably wondering, how do we expect everybody to go foraging? In Frick Park, Shenley Park, Riverview Park, North River Park, wherever it is, won't we completely denude the landscape? First, I don't expect everybody to pick it up. I would love people to adopt this lifestyle. I'm realistic. Very few people here are actually going to do it. Very few people will do it on a daily basis. Very few people will do it on a weekly basis, maybe a monthly basis, maybe just a few times a year. Once the morels are gone, people are out of the woods, trust me. <laughs> Just don't even go out when the morels are out there. Leave <laughs> those lines sometimes. <laughs> now, I understand. There are people who forage, who leave a deep footprint on the land. They practice legal harvesting methods, and it saddens me. It really does. But you know what saddens me more? Look at the culture we're raised in. We live in the murky waters of modern capitalism right now, which trains us to feel, what can I get? How fast can I get it? What kind of resources can I extract? How much money can I make off of this? As quickly as I possibly can. So of course, when people go out into the woods who aren't biophiles, who don't have an emotional connection to the land, who don't have mentors who teach them, of course they're going to practice legal harvesting methods. Just see how much money can I make and leave a deep footprint on the land. You see this with American ginseng right now. You see this with golden seal. You're starting to see this with wild leeks, ramps, some other species as well. However, are foragers the only reason that these species are vulnerable right now? Are they the only reason? Or is something else going on right here? Good question, because something else is going on. Something more insidious is going on. If you look at the list of threatened plants in Pennsylvania, endangered plants, vulnerable plants, how many of them are edible? Very few. Very few are sought out by foragers. A lot of them are sedges. Who forages for sedges? Most people can't write that. I don't, even, I, don't, I don't know my sedges at all, so I wouldn't even touch them. Some of them are poisonous, the monk's hood. They're beautiful plants, beautiful flowers, but those ones are threatened as well. It's not foragers that are doing that. What's going on? Destruction of native habitats right now, on a massive scale. Massive developments in Pennsylvania. Industrial agriculture. <laughs> The logging industry, energy resource extraction, aka fracking, pollution, chemical runoff, list goes on and on. Yes, foragers are on that list, but they're probably near the bottom. During my workshops, during my programs, of course in this presentation, I stress the importance of sustainable foraging. And you're probably like, what does that even, what does that mean with foraging? Aren't you just taking from the land? It's different for every plant. I can't give you an answer. 10%. 25% of it, it's just different for every plant. Whenever possible, we practice non-legal harvesting methods. Look, trout lily, Erythronium americanum, a beautiful plant. You can harvest those tubers. That plant takes four to seven years just to flower. Four to seven years. I'm probably not going to dig that one up. I'll probably pass on that because you know garlic mustard's growing right next to it. And garlic mustard's great. I'm also careful to balance taking from the land with giving back. And I'm always trying to think, how can we give back? We're going to take. If we're going to take something, how do we give back? And so now, this year, I'm giving out native edible plants in my workshops. So whenever we are taking from the land, taking from the land, the participants are associating that with, okay, we have to give back as well. And so they can plant these plants on their property and just eat that. That way they don't have to go anywhere else. The more workshops they attend, the more plants they'll get. <laughs> <laughs> or they can plant it in community places with the support of community leaders. 
What it really comes down to is a lack of education. It's a skill set that is a culture we just don't value. It's a lack of mentors. It's a lack of elders in our society. This society, not every society. It's a lack of elders in this society who cherish this information, intimately pass it down to their children and to future generations. So let's put an end to it. Why are we teaching this to four-year-olds? Geography's fine, history's great, math is fantastic. ABCs, got none of them. Why not 15 edible plants in your backyard? Why are we teaching this to ninth grade biology students? Why are we teaching this to ecology students? Why aren't botanists trained in this? So they can teach it to people who want to learn from them. Those are all good questions. And you know where you can start? Start on your own property. If we garden, why aren't you planting wild, edible native species? And I'm not saying dig them up in the wild. Support your native plant nurseries. They have great resources. They've got so many wonderful plants. Many of them are edible. And they're probably more fit, stronger, more robust than a lot of the non-native domesticated crops we're planting. You know, it's, it's always funny, the native plant nurseries. I want to talk to the marketing team, because they seem to market towards non-human entities. Like, supports the pollinators as if the pollinators are reading it. <laughs> the wildlife is reading it. Look, if you're going to plant a native tree on your property, plant a native tree that helps the pollinators, that helps the wildlife, that's also edible, that you can eat, that produces edible nuts, that produces edible fruits. If you're going to plant a native shrub on your property, plant a native shrub that produces edible fruits. <laughs> if you're going to plant perennial greens, plant perennial greens that hold the soil in place, that are medicinal, that provide fibers, that provide dyes. You know, if you've got sugar maples in your property, you probably have a rich understory. Try to get American ginseng going. Try to get golden seal going. Learn how to steward that land. Teach your children that. Teach the community what you are doing. So that when you go off into the wildlands and start foraging with the permission of those landowners, you will know already how to do it. Because you're not going to dig up every wild leaf ball in your property. It won't be there the next year. You're going to learn. You're going to teach others. You go out there, you will already be a steward. But this whole hands-off approach to the natural world, you stay on the trail. If you step off the trail, you as an individual are the reason those wildflowers are dying. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's a fracking pad a quarter of a mile away. There's a housing development cutting into the northwest corner of the forest, but you are the reason that blood root's not there anymore. <laughs> it's got to stop. We have to figure out a strategic way to reintegrate highly domesticated human beings with the landscape. One of the easiest ways to do it, one of the most effective ways to do it, is to eat that land. Forage for wild food and wild medicine. So we like bullet points here, and I apologize, there weren't a lot of bullet points in this presentation. What can we do to summarize all of this? Take a foraging class. I'm not the only one that teaches this. There are a lot of people in Pennsylvania Try to take one from somebody who teaches sustainable foraging me measures and one who actually forages. Because there are people who just talk about it and they don't do it. <laughs> Connect with other foragers in your area. Where do you find them? See bullet point number one. <laughs> read books. Does anybody read books anymore? <laughs> I'll let you in on the secret with the library. You can check out 50 books at a time. <laughs> How do I know? Because I've had 49. <laughs> They have a lot of great books from the library, a lot of foraging books, but not only that, check out wildflower books, mushroom books, moss books, fern books, winter weed identification. All books are fair game. Join a nature club. I'll talk about this in a second. There are so many in Pennsylvania. And just do it. Look, we all know what dandelion looks like. We all know what blueberries look like. We all know what cranberries look like. We all know what apples look like. They all grow wild here in Pennsylvania. So many times we like to rationalize things, get lost in our head, before actually just jumping in and doing it. Just showing up is 86% of the battle. The rest of it will take care of itself. Just go out and do it. So it's no surprise that I like to learn this kind of information. One can say I'm obsessed with learning as much as I possibly can and trying to interact with it in an intimate way. However, I wasn't really taught this information growing up. I really wasn't. I learned a whole lot, I learned about Espanol, I learned my math, I learned my geography, but I wasn't really taught place-based skills. I wasn't taught, you know, what is the sugar maple doing here? Why is it pulling the sap up in the tree? Sure, I took plant biology, but we learned about tropical plants and a cactus that grows halfway around the world. 
why not learn about the violence that is just growing outside? So we're not really taught as a culture place-based skills. However, Pennsylvania is such a great state. You know why? Because Guns N' Roses is coming. <laughs> I, really, I, mean, I don't really like it that much. It's trending on Facebook right now. You're a Guns N' Roses fan. You saw the 92. Very good. Pennsylvania is great because there's so many nature clubs. So many nature clubs. It is ridiculous how many there actually are, even in southwestern Pennsylvania. There are so many environmental centers, arboretums, places like Phipps, but not really compared to Phipps. Phipps is one of the best. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but sometimes, you know, there's so much noise on the internet, it can be so difficult to find where these organizations are, when they're leading events, what does it cost, how do I connect to them? And I thought, you know what? I want to create a solution for this because I want to learn this information. A lot of people want to learn this information. So I created a website that helps local web developers here in Pittsburgh, and it's learnyourland.com. And it's an interactive community and database of naturalists, nature organizations, state parks, environmental centers, arboretums here in Pennsylvania. Right now, with a strong focus in southwestern Pennsylvania, because obviously that's where I live, so I can network much more easily here. But it's an easy way for people to connect with the naturalists who want to connect with people so they can easily find each other. And it's really easy to do. You can just search by your location. For example, Western PA, and your topic is plant. You can search animals. You can search birds. You can search mushrooms. Pins come up on the map. You can click on it, see who's closest to you. You can click on one of the naturalists, and their events pop up. This is the Wissahickon Nature Club. They've got a lot of events coming up. How many of you would know that they've got a nature walk, a voice maybe you, park? They don't do a lot of advertising, so I'm going to do it for them. And it's 100% free. And I need your help because I cannot do it alone. If you are a naturalist or if you work for any of these organizations, please hit the join button and you can put your profile on there. It's 100% free. It takes four minutes or less. You can upload all the classes that you want. If you don't work for any of these environmental centers, nature centers, if you're not a naturalist and you know somebody who is, please tell them about this. Hit the join button. It takes four minutes or less. And if none of that applies to you, I've got an email list out there. So I send out an email maybe two or three times a month with a listing of events. I try my best to put out a new video every two weeks as a YouTube channel. I do mushroom identification, plant identification, interviews. I did an interview with Roxanne last year, so you can check that one out. Um, but all kinds of great things. And you can unsubscribe at any time. But I really could use your help, um, either by writing an email address, we can stay in touch, or if you're a naturalist, to sign up as well, because it is a group effort. And we already have close to 60 different organizations on there already, and it's 100% free. So this is the last slide, I promise. So I just want to read you a quote. Yeah, I know you guys can read this, but I'll read it to you anyway. <laughs> Our land here is the dearest thing on earth to us. And that was with Kenya and Scott White Thunder. He was a Lakota chief, late 1800s, right at the height of the US government takeover of their lands. And of course, their lands were taken away. Notice he didn't say, our land is a dear thing. He didn't say, it is one of the dearest things. He was open about it. He spoke from his heart. He spoke a truth that all of us do feel deep, 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 deep down inside. Our land here is the dearest thing on earth to us. So that's me in front of the tallest eastern white pine tree in the northeastern United States. Does anybody know where that is? Yeah, Cook Forest. 184 feet tall and growing. This is a place that I go to to really feel it. Sure, I use my analytical mind, I try to identify things, but my emotions take over. I really feel it when I'm at this place. How do I know I'm emotionally bonded to a place like this? Because when I leave, it hurts. I want to go back. This is what Pennsylvania used to look like in many spots. It's what very few spots look like today. It's what Pennsylvania could look like in the future. And so I'm encouraging you, go to places that do it for you. Whatever makes you feel that hurt when you leave it and you just want to go back, go there. Spend as much time as you possibly can there. It might not be Cook Forest. It might be another state park. It might be old hunting grounds that your grandfather or some mentor took you to many years ago. It might be a stream down 
the block, around the corner. It might be the woods in your backyard. Wherever it is, go there. Spend as much time as you possibly can there. Don't even question it, just go there. People are going to look at you like you're crazy. You're going to be bored at first. It's going to be boring. It's going to be boring for a year or two. It's not going to make any sense. You're going to have to give up your Friday nights, your Saturdays, your Sundays. People are going to say, why are you doing this? Say, I'm just doing it. Adam told me to do it. <laughs> it's not going to make sense in one year. It's not going to make sense in two or three or four years. Perhaps on the fifth or sixth year, the answers will come to you. It'll start to make sense. And when you are there, ready for it. Don't be passive. Don't be passive. <laughs> be an active participant in that beautiful dance between you and Mother Earth. Breathe deeply that air. Drink that spring water. And yes, the best places will have clean spring water. But perhaps most relevant to this discussion, eat that food. Your life can be the greatest love story ever told. <coughs> a story that illustrates the reunion between you and a long lost lover. And that is your land. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, Adam's up there a lot, of, um, a lot checking plants out, so you can probably um, connect with him or me, and we can show you some of the edibles. There's Sylvanian is uh, yeah, uh, right here in, in Squirrel Hill. Yeah, in Squirrel Hill. I believe they opened in a couple weeks. I called them actually yesterday. They said a couple weeks. And, and uh, the proprietor that Captain McGregor uh, started with native plants and the volunteer at Hingham Farms. So uh, it's, they're hardly competitors. Yeah, right. Here. Absolutely. Uh, and she's right in Squirrel Hill. Anything else? Yes. Adam, are you seeing any morels yet? <coughs> <laughs> Me personally, no, I haven't had. Okay. Honestly, I worked hard on this presentation. <laughs> so, no, I didn't go out and look for else. However, they have been spotted in Pennsylvania already. Mm -hmm. So, with these rains that we've been getting, it wouldn't surprise me if next week would be pretty good to look for them. Dead and dying elm trees, look around there. Tulip poplar trees, one of my favorites. Apple orchards, will be careful because if you let arsenic in the soil, and some other hardwood trees as well. Have you found any yet? No. Okay. Where do you like to look? <laughs> See how close that was? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? You mentioned invasives. There's always been disturbed land, but why do you think there's so many more invasives now? Are we just, do we just notice them more? The, disturb, the level of disturbance today is unprecedented, I believe. Native Americans disturb the land. Some of them would farm, some of them would burn the underbrush. I don't think we're seeing the disturbance, I don't think we've ever seen this level of disturbance before, so we're seeing more and more of it. However, they are rehabilitating the land as well. There are so many studies documenting how these invasive plants are actually rehabilitating the land, whether it's mussels in the Great Lakes, the zebra mussels, that are detoxifying some of the chemical compounds in there, or giant reed, which is detoxifying some of the organ some of the poisons that are in the water. Um, so I think there there's benefits to them and of course there are negative repercussions to the basis. I think because our land is so disturbed right now, the people are very disturbed as well. A lot of them provide medicines as well. For example, Japanese knotweed. Where is it largely found? Northeastern United States. There's research on Japanese knotweed and Lyme disease. Where is Lyme disease most prevalent? Northeastern United States. So on some other level, it's almost like the invasive species are here not only to help the land to some degree, of course not always, but they're here to help the people as well. But honestly, I think it comes down to mass developments in Pennsylvania and not giving the land time to rehabilitate, and also humans not taking a major active role in stewarding the land, letting them thrive. Generations ago, Native Americans were burning the underbrush to keep a lot of the young saplings from coming up, if Japanese barbary was there back then, it wasn't because it came in the 1800s, they would get rid of it. Because think about it, if you're hunting, you can't step on sticks in the woods. You have to clear all that out. If you're shooting a bow and arrow, it has to be clear. You have to be able to shoot very far. They burned the forest. They would clear cut land just to hunt much better. So they would be stewarding and getting rid of a lot of the annuals that would patch up the land when disturbances were there. And it seems like we're not allowed to do that anymore. So we just pick them because it doesn't seem the best option. Or we'll poison them, it doesn't seem the best option. But I think this one did that. Yes? When I was young, so you Gibbons was the, was the name. <laughs> what do you think about the work that he did a few decades ago? Wasn't he doing it with grape nuts? <laughs> <laughs> the grape nuts guy. Yeah. Come on. He was, though. Maybe he had to grape nuts. Yeah, she's saying that. <laughs> Honestly, he, yeah, he, he did work with Grape Nuts for the end of his career. I think he's great. He, he was one of the first people who actually popularized it, brought it back into pop culture. And I think we needed that at the time. Um, of course, there were lots of people who were living off the land at the time who were doing it in private, but he actually had the guts to put himself out there. And of course, he did way more good than harm. I don't think he did much harm. Maybe there are a few errors in his book, and some people are quick to point that stuff out right now. But I think he throws a lot of philosophy in there as well, not just identification tips, how to harvest it, but why we should be doing it as well. And the library has a few of his copies. Did you get into them? No, no not around? a whole lot. It was just really, it was really prevalent. It was mm -hmm. certainly out there in, in, in the culture at the time. And I remember it was, it was joked about a bit, you know, like Eden Park and that kind of thing. But, <laughs> but I just wondered, because it seems like 
it's almost generational. We maybe, maybe we skipped a generation. You have a great deal of enthusiasm for this, but I, have, I personally haven't seen that in, in a while. And, and, uh, and I, you know, obviously, I think it's a different time now than it was. Maybe he was a man a little bit ahead of his time. Or maybe it's You're right. Ahead. Yeah. He's gaining a lot of popularity right now. There are a lot of people getting into this, um, which is good and bad. I mean, you have to teach sustainability when foraging. Um, honestly, I never really did read a whole lot of this stuff. I read a couple of his works. He wasn't a major influence on me at all. There are much more modern foragers out there, I should say, um, that are actively putting out material. It seems like there are new books coming out. There are new forums on Facebook, online, uh, more walks for people leading these walks. It seems to be coming back. Uh, I think it's just reawakening some biological seed inside of us, like coming out of a deep, dark slumber. Like, yeah, you're right. I should, maybe I should be out there interacting. With I should just make the one, just the one point that the foraging, I think, is a, is a really good idea for all the reasons you put out there. But as you're as you're working your way into a space to forage, it's really important to notice things and to know that this is a rare plant that maybe I can't eat, but it, it, because of the biophilia, we really need to preserve it. So. I feel like it's so important that we, we do inventory what's there, we, we choose our path to the to the, to the harvestable things very carefully, because I, I've seen far too many examples of where people beat a path into the patch of morels or the patch of whatever, and they've trampled tiny orchids this big that are you know just rarely found in the state and that sort of thing. So I, I just would, I mean, you don't want to be at the point where you're so frozen that you're afraid to take a step because you might harm something, but by the same token, there's got to be a balance there. I mean, Absolutely, it's a great point. I can't eat, but are there for another purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great point. Yes. I just wanted, to, uh, I don't know if everybody knows that you can eat Japanese knotweed, mm -hmm. and right now it's coming up, and when it's just like that or that, you can break off those little sprouts, and you can, um, I use them in stir fry, I put them in soup, uh, you can mix them up with your apples and make an apple pie or uh, and uh, they're very good. And there's so much of the apple. What about supporting restaurants and forage or grow their own um, Yeah, I think, I think it's a great idea. Regarding foraging, I would just make sure that they are receiving from ethical foragers. Well, it's, I mean more so those who grow whether on the roof or wherever. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, what well, it doesn't even look like that. You're right. Somebody should create a website like that for the restaurants. <laughs> You're right. I don't eat up too much, so I don't know a whole lot about those restaurants. But I'm sure a lot of people here can talk to you about which ones are actually growing things on their roof. Chapter yeah, Phipps, yeah. Phipps, Phipps is doing it right here. You guys are close now, though, right? Yeah, close now. The porch. Yeah, they've got a nice garden. Too cynical. So, <laughs> <laughs> Too skeptical. <laughs> With the Carnegie Library system, they will ship any book to you, to your Carnegie Library. Speakers. Oh, speakers. Yeah. They will ship me to there. <laughs> How do you contact me? I will be shipped there. <laughs> yeah, I would love to. If you want to talk to me after. Yeah. What percentage of your diet is foraged? I knew someone was going to ask this. <laughs> now, one of the bullet points was going to be this is a spectrum. I really like live in Pittsburgh. Most of us live in Pittsburgh. It's very hard to make 100% of your diet a foraged diet. Most of my medicine, I would say 90%, 95% is foraged. My medicine. Most of my protein is wild, thanks to a deer that I got last year. All of my water is wild. Yes, you can harvest wild spring water. If you want to know what the springs are, I'll show you. Most of my greens right now are foraged. When it comes to the starch and vegetables, I'm not so good at that right now. But honestly, it's maybe one third on a good day, or less than that. If you speak to the most outspoken foragers today, they'll tell you how hard it is. And it is hard, because we weren't raised with this skill set. We have jobs, we have things to do. Um, but those are the numbers that's what I'm throwing out there right now. And it doesn't have to be all or nothing, honestly. Just the fact that you go out there and put something in your body that was growing wild, that you harvested sustainably with permission of the landowners, <laughs> says so much about you, and it will transform your body. 
It's not about numbers, it's about just the act of doing it. Just going out there, the land will love you for doing that. But what about you? What numbers? <laughs> Well, I did yesterday, and I'm wondering if the Jerusalem artichokes are harvestable <laughs> right now. Yes. Uh, what percentage? Marin says, yeah. Yeah, you can. From 32 pounds to Lego Bistro, along with onions and garlic, which will be made of pesto with somebody else's nettles. So Lego Bistro is a restaurant. Yes, think about Jerusalem artichokes. Um, at least the Jerusalem artichokes on my property, they're not really sprouting yet, so all the energy is still in the root. Once it shoots up, you probably don't want to harvest it until it dies back down, because it's a root vegetable. Springs or fall, those are the best times to harvest uh, root vegetables. It's a small percentage now, but we grow sprouts inside, but that's not a It's better than 95% of people, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, I mean, it's a great stepping stone, for sure. Yeah, kitchen Grow nettle sprouts. One more? Yeah. yeah, we have one more. And then I'll be around that day. Yes, Jim. I'm, I'm crazy about lambs' courses. Mm -hmm. But that's one thing. But also in Hazelwood, at the edge of where the mill used to be, Uber is building a 60-foot wide bioswill um, a little living buffer on one side of it. So there's a, it's several hundred yards long on, on the one side of the street and where some of us are trying to convince them because they have a mindset when you build when you plant a planting in the city they have a list of own and I really like what you said because they 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 have a in their mindset you don't want anything that's edible you don't want anything that's and there's only certain things they want drought and flood color in plants because they understand that climate change is happening and we say there's a water problem there in that area. So it's part of the water management in the area. But the, 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 the frustrating thing is that there's a flexibility we're, we're trying to get them to expand because we know that we need to transition to more permaculture type of things. And this is a perfect thing. So if anybody would help um, convince people in the city, they have a of, you know, they're already in here to deliver and subcontract and everything. A specific group of plants, and none of them are edible. And really, it's, to me, it sounds ridiculous. Are they all calorie repairs? The what? Calorie repairs. Yeah, that's what people plant. Calorie. Yeah, the brass repairs. Oh, okay. white flowering trees. I mean, it's, it's just that's usually to me, it's just they, there's some some division in people's mind that says this is decorative. This is agricultural, and the two are not the same. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. I mean, yeah, you, know, you can put herbs; they come back every year. Mm -hmm. Some of the clean pollution, or some that. Um, so, I just, uh, I, we really need help to get people, the city to change, and the urban agriculture people are working to change the law on a lot of things. So, yeah, that's great. I know you're doing a lot of work too. So, keep it up. I think that's all, that's all the questions, correct? Yeah, anybody else? I'll be up here. I'll be around for a little bit. Thank you very much. And uh, please uh, feel free to continue the conversation. And thanks again for all coming. And please join us again next month.